Uh, well, I guess the audience is the room, as always. Well, for this term. Uh, for this term. So you're gonna read first, and then I'll start the timer. Yeah, I'll read, then pray, and then start. <coughs> okay, Hebrews chapter nine, by the way. And was there a title given to this? Oh, At some point, Dylan later. was okay. We'll later. Cool. <coughs> uh, Hebrews chapter nine, verses one through ten. Here we go. <coughs> now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place. Having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna, an Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets on the, of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their rituals. But into the second only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. And as always, we're just grateful for how you speak to us. I pray that you would help me in this time to just help my memory, for starters, help my mind to be clear and the words as well to be clear, but to soften our hearts that we may be touched by what you have to say. And all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> So I grew up with a number of brothers, and just about half of us you could probably consider as pyromaniacs. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I would include myself maybe in a lesser degree. Um, we often go outside and build big fires, and uh, sometimes they were inside, probably so, uh, a few too many uh, on the inside. The point is, been around a lot of fires, and we would go outside at sometimes and try and build the biggest bonfire we can build. Have you ever been around a big bonfire before? I mean like two stories tall, just, just absolutely ferocious fire. If you have, you know that this is not the kind of fire you can just walk up to and roast a marshmallow. Because you would be the roasted marshmallow before you had a chance to even roast one. It's the same reason why the Bible calls God a consuming fire. Because if you were to try and stand in the middle of a fire, we all know this, you'd be roasted. But it's not just standing in the actual middle fire itself that's dangerous. With a consuming fire, as you even approach the fire, that's when you really start to feel the heat. The same thing is true with God. It's not just in the very center of God's presence that is dangerous. God is such a consuming fire that as you approach Him, His holiness just roasts anything that is unholy. This passage talks a lot about God's presence and how it, He has tried for all of history to dwell with unholy humans. And let's just get this out into the open now. You and I, we are still not perfectly holy, are we? So, how do we actually get to that center of God's presence? Our passage parks in the Old Testament pretty much the whole time. 
And it's going to use the Old Testament to help us understand our reality today because there is a lot to learn from the Old Covenant. Studying this passage has impressed on me how much it actually takes to be with God. And by this, the author pleads with us, keep in mind what it really takes to be with God. Just because it's so easy to forget everything God did, everything that had to happen, just for us to be with God. So just keep in mind what it really takes to be with God. So like I said, it's going to be in the Old Testament most of the time, and for the first seven verses, one through seven, we're going to look at how hard it was to be with God. And verses 8 through 10, it's going to start making reflections on how it's still hard to be with God. The first verse sets up our passage quite clearly. It says, Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. So, this, this holy place, the, the worship place, this is the tabernacle that he's talking about. And uh, he's going to begin listing off all these things that were made in the tent or the tabernacle. Right? The first section of the tabernacle, there's this lampstand, the bread of presence, the, um, the table. Uh, and then you go further in, closer to the fire itself, the hot spot of God's presence, you get some other things like the golden altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, and more stuff. The details are not as relevant as he even says. It's not like we need to go into all the details, but if you were a first reader of this book, it would click probably easier for you than it would for the rest of us in the room. Because if you were to be reading this, you would instantly think back, oh yeah, the book of Exodus, when Moses was on the mountain at Mount Sinai because no one else could go up to the mountain where God was. God was trying to be with His people, but He couldn't. There's a problem. And so, God was telling him a blueprint for this tabernacle, a place where God can actually go and move in among the people of Israel. But along the way, God had repeated this refrain over and over again. He would tell him, Hey Moses, make sure that you follow everything according to the pattern that I am showing you. Shows him the lamps and, Hey, make sure you follow everything according to the pattern that I am giving you. Everything to the color, the height, the measurements. Every detail was to be followed precisely and exactly. Why? The strenuous effort and the details of this task of making sure everything was perfectly in line is to show us just how much of a task it is for an unholy man to finally make it into God's presence. And then you enter into the, the second ten. I don't know if you noticed this repeated word here that the author was clearly getting at. In the hot spot of God's presence, the fire itself, the, the second room, there was a golden altar of incense. The covenant, the Ark of the Covenant was covered all, all sides with gold. And there was a golden urn. And then there was this glorious cherubim. So what's up with all the gold and then this glorious cherubim? Well, in biblical terms, it's pretty simple, actually. Gold is supposed to be shiny, right? It's glorious, iridescent. It's no surprise that the Garden of Eden was described as having, having gold in it, onyx, other precious jewels that were shiny, like the glorious presence of God. It's just the biblical imagery here. But the point is clear. That this is essentially a portable Eden, which is a huge deal, even for people in the Old Covenant. Because like I said, it's really hard for man to be with God, and yet, here's this 
reestablishment of Eden. Is it God's fault that it was so hard of a process for man to finally be with God? No, actually the problem is not with how holy God was. The problem is actually with how unholy man is. Just look at the beginning of the story. Back to Eden. There was a time and a place where God and man dwell together with none of these heavy regulations, with none of the strenuous effort. It even said they walked together in harmony and there was none of this. But as soon as sin entered humanity, God said, you have to go. Because like a consuming fire, God would roast them. So finally, when all the patterns were sorted out perfectly according to the pattern that God showed them on the mountain, it was finally here. They can finally go in. But it wasn't everybody. There was still more limitations to come. The limitations being on how many people can actually go into God's presence. It says that the priests, they can go into the first section. They can approach the fire, but they can't go into it. Which, by the way, the priests, only a fraction of a fraction of the people. Among those people, only one person is able to go into the second tent, the fire itself. But he can only go one time a year. And he can only do that if he brings blood in from a sacrificed animal to atone for his sins and the sins of the rest of the people. That is a lot to just make it before God. One person, one time a year, with more regulations. It takes a lot for man and God to actually be together. And it's not God's fault. It's man's fault. But it's still a huge upgrade. This is a big upgrade from any time between the tabernacle and the Garden of Eden. God's actually now here. You might think, well, what happened? Like, why can't anyone just do that? Why can't anybody just go into the tent? Because just one person is a very small amount of people compared to the thousands and thousands of people that were hoping that this priest would mediate well. Well, we know that wasn't God's plan in the first place. Because even at the mountain, God told them, hey, I'm going to want to make you actually a kingdom of priests. In other words, at some point, my plan is to make all of you be able to come in and be with me. But for now, it was just one person, one time of year with regulations. And if you think, well, why can't more people come in? Well, Actually, just look at the priests who did come in. It was actually, if you remember, the first day of the job for the first priests, they come in to the Holy of Holies, and they did not think or consider just how hard it is to be with God. They offered the wrong kind of sacrifice. Just flippant. Just didn't really regard just how big of a gap there is between the holiness of God and the unholiness of man. And so like a consuming fire, they fell over dead. Nonetheless, God continues to try to move in with His people. They move into to the actual promised land. And He says, look, I want this to be my permanent home, to permanently reside with you people. I want you to build me a temple. So I can permanently live with you. But the problem of sin persisted. And the priests didn't get any better. In fact, they probably actually got worse. They spiraled even worse. Instead of making wrong sacrifices to God, they totally ignored God and went to other gods. And they did abominable things in the temple itself. And so just like with the Garden of Eden, how they had to send them out, he himself left the temple. Supposedly his permanent home. 
you left. Because the people of Israel did not consider just how hard it is for an unholy man to be with a holy God. So what does this all have to do with today? That was in the Old Covenant. Things have changed, right? Well, there's actually a lot that's still similar today. Maybe more than you realize. First, first of all, God is still just as holy as He has ever been. The fire is still just as hot. And second of all, humans are just as unholy as ever. Maybe worse. <clears throat> Look at how he takes this all, all, all the Old Covenant ideas and symbolizes them to today. Starting in verse 8, he says, by this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet open <coughs> as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. It talks about how this old covenant couldn't cleanse the conscience, but it cleansed the body. And so in the old covenant, with all of the regulations and the ceremonial cleansings, they were over here where they could just only cleanse the body, but they couldn't be over here where they cleanse the conscience. The new covenant has changed things. It says just after this passage that Christ's blood does purify our conscience. But, look around. Is that taken full effect yet? Or can you tell me, if your conscience is perfectly clear, you don't need to hear the sermon. You don't need to be here. That's what the author of Hebrews is doing here. He's saying, hey, look, keep in mind, God is still so, so much more holy than you realize. And you are still so, so much more sinful than you realize. Especially as, as we go about our days just studying the Word consistently, it's really easy to forget these simple things. It's really easy to think that, like, I, I kind of deserve the mercy of God. I can kind of just rush in on God and enter that fire itself. It's so easy to overlook our sins. Hopefully, when you read the Bible, especially in a passage like this, you can lower your view of yourself. Hopefully, As the Bible is trying to tell you, you can understand that you don't deserve God's mercy, even if Jesus has purified your conscience. Right now, I mean, just this morning, if, could you say that you could enter the Holy of Holies in the Old Covenant based on your record today? God is still a consuming fire. And we have still ought to have so many unholy impurities in our lives to cleanse out of us. So we're in this new covenant where we're partially cleansed, but not all the way cleansed. And that's where the theologians that, of our day can be pretty helpful when we talk about this already, but not yet. That Jesus' blood has purified our conscience, but we have so much more to go. Or maybe as Paul says in another book, in Colossians 3, he says, you, your old self has died. Therefore, put to death your old self. If it was hard to be with God back in the Old Testament, do you think it's still hard to be with God in the New Testament? Do you not think that Jesus is still just as holy as He ever was, and you are not any more holier than they were? Were they in the Old Testament? Do 
when you keep in mind just how hard it is to be with God, do you realize, do you take seriously your sanctification? How serious are you about purifying yourself before a holy God? Because let me tell you, according to this passage, God is infinitely serious about making sure you are a holy people. And if God takes it seriously, you should as well. Just how hard, to what length should you work at your sanctification? The answer, the right answer is there is no length. You should work endlessly and tirelessly toward the goal of your sanctification because God cares endlessly and tirelessly for it. But there will be a day. If you look at the end of the Bible, there will be a day when the conscience is fully cleared. When the blood of Christ has had its full effect. At the end of the book of Revelation talks about how God, as the consuming fire He is, will burn away everything unholy. And when He has come to do that, I hope that He has come back to a holy people. I hope that there is nothing in your life that He needs to burn away. Because He is making all things new. Just remember and keep in mind what this passage is telling us. It takes a lot to be with God. There's so much that went into God just simply living with humans. And the same is true today. If you want to be with God forever, take seriously your own holiness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word again. Thank you for how you speak. Would you... Grant to us help as we are very slow at this process called sanctification. Would you continually remind us of how unworthy we are of the grace of your presence, but also remind us that you are always moving to be with us as the gracious and loving and kind God that you are. Help us to never forget how much it really takes for you to accomplish the goal of being with us. Help us to take it as seriously as you do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take a few moments to uh, write down our, our thoughts. <coughs> and we'll get going. <coughs> Stop the, uh, stop the, oh yeah. <laughs> Still have four minutes, bro. <laughs> I can keep going. I think Don and I are ready. I'm ready. ready. He's ready too. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's get going. Um, I'll say, uh, and come around this way. Um, what was something that encouraged you as you uh, went through prepared for this sermon? Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the main applications here is that if they went through all of that to be with God, mm -hmm. like, what makes me think I can just sit back and not take my salvation seriously? Mm. Yeah, yeah you, you touched on for a bit, like, how... God wants to make us all priests and that just got me thinking of like you know I, we'll talk about the priesthood of all believers but like what a privilege that is to like something to to really like appreciate and take seriously so yeah I, I, that really encouraged me yeah the, how fired up God is about making his people holy mm -hmm. how uh, the lengths he's willing to go that, that really hit me hard
I really was encouraged just how much you stressed about us working on our simplification. Like it was important for you, and you emphasized it was important for us. It reminded me how important it is. I really encourage you. Yeah, this idea of uh, God desiring to be with us, despite of how sinful and unworthy we are, um, I think that really gets to to affect the emotions of why we should really be appreciative and grateful and value uh, God, right, for all He is and, and has done. Yeah. But do we do one encouragement? Or do we uh, usually we one do two. Yeah, one encouragement. Two, two slaps first. on the wrist and two good jobs. All right. Yeah, and also, yeah, definitely, that came through big, um, that's a service to be with us. I'm grabbing a sheet to write. <laughs> uh, one thing that I did that, or can improve on, or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. next to the sign improvement, so what, what's something that you felt you could improve on? Uh, what was difficult for you about this? I found it really difficult to have more various applications. Mm. Yeah, uh, there's plenty. I think there's plenty to improve on, but that's what I'll go with. Okay. The biggest thing for me was I really needed like a why, mm. like why I want to go into God's presence. Like mm. with how hard it is, mm. why do I want to uh, run into a fire? <laughs> I guess I, I think that would have helped me a lot, like with just like my motivation through the sermon. If you could have given me a why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I, I about halfway through the sermon, I was like, I need more, I need more application. And then you gave them to me, and I knew I was going to regret writing it as soon as I did. <laughs> <laughs> I think like you could probably do a little bit. But you, you established a need at the beginning, but I felt like I needed something a little more specific to the people in this room. And I think you could maybe drop some hints in your first section of those applications that you're going to get to later. Mm -hmm. Makes sense? Or like, try to give show me that I need this application that you're going to give. Me. I was try. I like I really was thinking about how I can do that because like without giving too much away. Yeah. And I went with the more cautious of just like not teasing anything. Yeah. I don't know. Do you like recommend think, a way to do it or? And I think it's the same thing he's getting at. For me, it felt like I, I didn't have much tension in the first half of the mm -hmm. sermon. Mm -hmm. uh, the so tension would have helped. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I literally wrote that down. I was like, you could have kept tension more. Like you started talking about Eden. Mm. I was just like, why, what's so special about you and why it's important when you talk about the gold and how the tabernacle was built, like, you could have built that, of like, what was so special, like, kind of questions talking about you did, hmm. why we should care about it, because, I mean, yeah, I know, but if I'm just sitting in a church, who cares, we're not there anymore, what's so special, Yeah. kind of, which, going to you kind of got close to it. Like you're getting it. This is what we're originally designed for. Whatever's yeah. inside that fire, to his point, is what we were designed to have and eat it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe that could, it could be a source like of that, the tension. Yeah. Saying something like that or like mm. emphasizing why it's so important in some way, either early on into that illustration. Yeah, it's kind of reiterating what everybody already has, has said. It, it was a little confusing at points where you kept on like saying, you know, look at how hard it is to be with God. And then also look how how God has, has always wanted to be with us. Um, and the question is like, why, right? Like you were saying, right? Like, why do we want to uh, be in God's presence? But also why does God bother to like, keep on making a way for us to be with him? Like why, like, I don't get that, right? Mm -hmm. So then when you bring the, th the whole thing with Eden, I think there's a lot of stuff that's being assumed uh, that yes. maybe a lot of uh, people don't, won't pick up on, won't get. So just clarifying those connections, um, like what's the connection between Eden and the temple? You could have said something very simple like, see God has always provided a place to be with his people, right? Um, 
we were never meant to live separate from God. Uh, in a riff on that idea. Yeah. I think this is a really tricky passage just in terms of like explaining things and like so I, I thought you, you actually did a good job explaining it but I think you could have made it and this is like I think a hard thing to do but make it like more interesting for me yep um, because I'm like yeah why why do I need to be interested in these things um, yeah which he did something very interesting I want to point out uh, you acknowledge that you know the o original audience would have been more familiar with this we won't be right that was yeah. a yeah. good move <laughs> that was yeah. very helpful <laughs> but then it would have been even more helpful if, if you were uh, excited and, and, and showing us like like maybe not every little furnishing in the temple Mm -hmm. But like, what was this pointing to? What's the big idea of mm -hmm. that this is, this is pointing to? Yeah, and I, I think again too, like to Adam's point, like applications in the first half could mm -hmm. have made me more interested in the way the temple mm -hmm. worked. Yeah, you you had this line that was like, we don't need to get into the details, mm -hmm. and they like there. I can kind of see what you're doing there, but I'd be careful with a line like that, especially early on. Just like, I wonder about the details. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I feel like you, what you should be, you should have been doing in that portion of the sermon is getting interested in the details. Um, but instead, you're like kind of dismissing them. Uh, I thought that was kind of a weak point for you, hmm. which uh, it was a little bit odd because you did end up going to some uh, some of the details yeah. and yeah. gave us some interesting stuff. But you 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 may have killed <laughs> some people's interest in if you put yeah. the line like. It's funny. And, and it also doesn't mean, right, that like you should go through like every single one because then we're going to be here till like next week. <laughs> yeah. But that, you know, just help us to see what these details are, are bringing out. Why is the author even bothering to mention it? Yeah. Um, other one. You, you kind of lost me a little bit, but maybe it was just me when you were talking about the one priest. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I felt like you went on a tangent. I think you like fixed yourself by saying God intended for us all to be priests, but I felt it didn't really help the argument too much till that point. So, yeah, I was a little lost, and it could have just been me missing it. But I, know, I was I was boarded out by it too. <laughs> <laughs> so you did something really just to piggyback off uh, CJ, uh, <coughs> mine, but just to. Uh, elaborate on that. You did something really great, which was give us your, your outline up front, mm -hmm. and it was very yeah. simple. It seemed very clear. And then as you went along, I think that's where you kind of started, I don't know where one ended and the other uh, began. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe oh, yeah. have that in mind as you're going along. Yeah. But the, the biggest one for me uh, is uh, like, what was the good news of the gospel? Mm -hmm. in, this, in this passage and talking about a place talking about how hard it is to be with God uh, like is there like a clear gospel connection where, where like maybe all this gets resolved uh, if you're asking me yeah oh um, I, I didn't have a complete like official moment of gospel connection mm -hmm. and I thought it would be suffice to like flirt with the gospel connection pretty much throughout the whole way um, and even like as I was wrapping up to think about the conclusion in the end of Jesus coming back I thought that was like yeah, maybe that's good enough mm -hmm. but I, I also agree like there wasn't a strong that was not a strong point yeah, like I, I, I could kind of see what you're, what you were doing, but again, it seems like there's an assumption being made that we're we're getting the gospel as we're going through, mm -hmm. rather than clearly telling us like this is the good news, right? And ultimately, I don't know. God has made Himself, uh, he, he has brought Himself close to us because we can come close to Him, and so He took on flesh, right, in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, 
Like really that <laughs> gospel centeredness, uh, I think would have been very helpful to also motivate your applications. Because otherwise yeah. I walk away thinking like, oh, this is something I have to do now. I have to really value my sanctification and work hard at this. Yeah. But it's not because I'm keeping in sight what Jesus has done, but how hard it is to be with God. And so yeah. I just walk away going, okay, I gotta try harder. I gotta do better. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, that's not good. I also didn't. I obviously thought about that, like, okay, so God did all the work for us, but then mm. it's just like, okay, so then that means I can sit back and not worry about my sanctification, mm. because Jesus did all the work for us, and so I was like, I can't, I can't make that my gospel connection, because I, I did think about this for a while. I was like, I don't know a great, like, full gospel connection. Mm which is why I did like the drippage along the way. Well, would maybe focusing on the Holy Spirit, how He helps change the mind, He helps change the heart. Like maybe yeah. go on. Yeah. Just thinking out loud, like, you know, you kept hitting on like how hard it is for us to be together, but then like Christ came to us. So there's, there's something about, you know, I don't think, I think you could say that without taking away all of the work we have to do. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I guess the relationship is two-sided. Well, yeah. the gospel should heighten our, our sense of sanctification, right? Yep. Because we, we see how much more, how much harder it truly is than we could imagine that God had to send His own begotten Son yeah. to yeah. die in the place of sinners, right? And yeah. that, that should motivate our sanctification rather than go, mm. like, oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe to see how much He did for us would motivate us to like do our part in the in this new covenant, mm -hmm. our part in the new partnership. To respond, respond yeah. to what he's done, valuing what he what he's done. <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, that that was the biggest one for me. Just the yeah. gospel clarity and letting that motivate your applications. Um, so, what's uh, something that you feel like you're improving in, or 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 you? Clearly, like, okay, I'm really gonna be working on this because this would help us also to be watchful, right? Like, and motivate you as we see improvements in what you're working. Yeah. On. Well, for those who've seen me, plenty of times in the past, I didn't do manuscript. Finally, okay. yeah, which is a new thing. Well, I tried it once before and it was abysmal. What did um, you do? I had a little paper here, okay. and then a little paper here. So you kind of use notes or. Yeah. Not a lot on those papers either. That's um, yeah, just page of some written out notes yeah. for me. Twenty minutes. Yeah. Uh, twenty one. Twenty twenty one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that honestly did work pretty well, I think, because it was definitely in the right direction. Because mm -hmm. what I was trying to do. Yeah. So Isaiah, I'm actually a little angry with you <laughs> because. Uh, I'm Good. scheduled to preach on the uh, Consuming Fire passage. <laughs> Your illustration was so good for explaining what that is. <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to do. That's <laughs> not stealing from you. Like, yeah, that like picture of like the heat of the bonfire yeah. is, I thought, very well done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're, you definitely did, a, a, I think, the person who's seen you preach the most. This is the most you were talking to me. Mm. Really? To the people yeah. um, I do think, <coughs> I think this is better than what you've done in the past. I, I could see you trying to think about what your yeah. next point was. Mm -hmm. So you do need, you probably need a little more robust of an outline than what you have there in, so, in some way to, to make sure we can't see you thinking you're, it's a little yeah. more natural, but it's still better <laughs> than the, the manuscript. So that, that was better. Um, You got to the why of the comp complication of the tabernacle. Like, as much as I wanted you to get into the details, you, you, you brought out the fact that, like, the, the point of all these complications is that this is really tough mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to get to the guy inside the tabernacle. And that was really helpful. Yeah, Don took my really <laughs> illustration to open with, I liked how upfront you were with your structure, saying this is my point one, this is my point two, this is where it'll be. Um, it was very helpful to follow along. 
police in the beginning could have gone back to it a little more, but yeah. still really, really good. Help me keep in mind, see where you were going. Yeah, you had a, a moment where you, you ramped things up that was like really like, uh, like exciting. Uh, despite the, like what Don had said earlier about like not making it very interesting at points, but when you got to, there will be a day and you went on that like little run, yeah. mm. like, oh, okay, it's not just something now, it's something to look forward to. Uh, that, that was like really, I thought really well done. That was like, like cool, like, I don't know yeah, how else to put it. <laughs> uh, another round? Yeah, I was also gonna remark on how you did a good job of speaking to us. Um, I think the, the way you approach it helped. Um, but to go with something else, um, yeah, you just really convinced me of your main point, like the whole way through. Um, I was 100% convinced. Um, and then, yeah, again, like your use of questions to drive home application, how serious are you being about being holy? Uh, throw it <laughs> on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was about to say that same thing. You. You did a good job of like explaining the application and then asking us. But since you already said that, um, you had this nice little part early on where you were like, "Is the problem God?" Mm. And you yeah. kind of played with that for a little mm -hmm. bit, and you're like, "No, nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's you." Yeah, it's you. yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a, it's very meeksy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I may have learned that from somebody. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that was, that was really really cool because the way you were presenting it, it was kind of like we have this like problem that God is holy. But then you kind of flipped it right there and it's like, well, the problem is not God's holiness, yeah. it's how sinful you yeah. are. Mm -hmm. was, that was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And you kept that, kind of to build on that, and probably my thing I enjoyed too, is you're like, but that was them. Is God still the same? And it's like, mm -hmm. God is still, he still requires the holiness, he still requires. Mm -hmm. And you said, we're just as simple as they were. Like, bringing it to us, mm -hmm. that was really good. Yeah. It's the same issue. Yeah. You just have the solution now in Christ. You delivered that line so dryly, too. You made it that much better. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us would get a little hyped when we knew we got something cool coming here. You were just like, nope. <laughs> 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 Anything else? Great use of your main point. You scattered it throughout and helped us track and. Mm -hmm. Just again, I think it's already been said. Uh, you were arguing right that we should keep in mind uh, what it takes to be with God, and so yeah, I walk away more mindful of God's holiness and my sinfulness, yeah, and and my need to take this serious. So yeah, good. Well, mission well accomplished done. there. Well done on repeating your, your main point. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.